The anthropocentric view of cognition suggests that cognitive complexity is a uniquely human trait. However, research conducted on a range of animals suggests that this is not the case. There is clear evidence that animals can rapidly solve novel problems, use tools, recognise and deceive individuals and plan for the future. They have sophisticated communication systems and show an understanding of the properties of physical objects, numbers, cause and effect. In this film, scientists discuss examples of their research and the implications for our understanding of animal intelligence. Importantly, the main players, the animals themselves, take centre stage. We've focused on cognition in birds for several reasons. Firstly, they're very widely distributed and people are familiar with them. Secondly, birds have followed an independent evolutionary pathway since they split from the reptiles during the Jurassic period about 150 million years ago. This means that their higher intelligence has developed independently from mammals. Thirdly, we wish to dispel this misconception that birds lack intelligence. In the future, perhaps the phrase bird brain will be complementary rather than derogatory. The New Caledonian Crow research started off really with a chance observation. And I was working in the mirror and saw a crow using a tool in the end of a dead branch. It seemed to be trying to weedle out insects and things. And when it finished doing that, it put the tool in its bill and flew away with it. And it seemed like intelligent behaviour to me. The New Caledonian crows make a range of tools from simple to complex shapes. They incorporate hooks into their tool making, which chimpanzees don't do. They spend a lot of time making their tools and also they look after their tools. They carry them around with them. This is one of the neat hooked twig tools that the crows make. These types of tools come from an elaborate manufacture process. Birds choose a leafy forked twig and they remove one side of the fork. Then they remove the tool for the branch. Then they refine the end, removing small pieces of wood. This seems to be a purposeful process. The end goal is to arrive at a hooked twig tool. And the hook here ends up quite pointed and quite an efficient tool for removing or hooking prey material out of sites. No other non-human animal manufactures hooks or even uses hooks in the wild. We've just seen crows make the hooked twig tool and, and it's an elaborate procedure. Amazingly they don't just make one type of hook tool, they make two kinds and the second kind is made out of leaf material. The pandanus leaf is a long narrow leaf and it's got natural barbs on the leaf edges. So the pros in this case are using natural hooks on the leaf material. Here we have the second type of hooked tool that the crows are making. And this we call as a stepped design. This is the tool counterpart. This remains on the leaf edge. The shape left on the leaf edge matches the, exactly the shape of the tool that's removed. So we can actually study the tools by looking at the counterparts. And this is a multi-step tool. And we can see it's wide at one end where the crows hold it in their bill. And it tapers down to a narrow working tip. So they're both are strong and sturdy, but also it enables birds to use a fine tip for fine manipulation. And as we can see, the barbs on the tool run back from the working tip. So the birds are able to use these barbs to hook prey out of sites that they can't get to with their bill. And the birds will use these in pandanus trees where they're made and also outside pandanus trees. So it's more, it's, it's like a multi-use tool. Um, the Swiss army knife in their toolkit, if you like. So in this film we can see a crow making a multi-stepped tool out of pandanus leaf. And the bird starts working away from the trunk and it, it first makes the narrow tip and then steps in, cutting in to make the tapered tool. And it will finally cut out the wide end and rip back to remove the tool from the leaf, leaving a nicely shaped counterpart on the leaf edge. And because it's working away from the trunk, the barbs are running back from the working tip allowing it to be used as a hooked implement to hook prey out of search sites. The major question in animal problem solving is what's going on in their head? Are they solving problems with sort of complex cognition in the way that we might, or are they following sort of simple associative rules? And a standard way of testing that is to use a trap tube 
uh, apparatus. Food can be moved along here. Food will typically be placed in the middle and you can see on the other side there is a trap. If food is pulled in that direction it will get stuck in the trap and the animal won't be able to get it out. Now what we did in the experiment with crows is systematically remove all the possible associative cues and still uh, our crows are able to solve this task. A feature of human uh, problem solving is not just that we can solve problems, but that we can see parallels, we can see analogies between problems. And this means that our problem solving is, is really quite flexible, it's the heart of our creative problem solving. And we were interested whether crows had similar cognitive abilities. Was it that the crows that had solved the trap tube task could then spontaneously solve a task that was causally similar, but physically very different? And here's what we gave them. We, we presented them with an apparatus a bit like this, that's called a trap table. When we give this to birds that have never been confronted with this task, they, the crows, they typically fail. But the ones that had learned to solve the trap tube task, they were spontaneously able, on the very first trial, able to solve this task. They always went for this side and not for the side of the trap. And what that suggests is that they'd grasp the relevant causal physical principles. Uh, you can only succeed by pulling food along a continuous surface. If you pull it where there's a trap, you will lose the food. So this suggests that crows are not just solving problems with simple associative learning, but can get deeper causal understanding of physical problems. So one of the things we've been really interested in is uh, what's the underlying cognition behind their, their tool use? And one way you can probe that is to see how flexible they are in their use of tools. So what we did was a simple experiment where we asked them not to use tools to get food, but instead to use a tool to get a tool to get food. Alex Taylor did a rather lovely simple experiment where there was a short tool on a piece of string, there was a long tool behind a kind of grill in a cage, and there was some uh, food down a short tube. And to solve this, what the crows needed to do spontaneously was to pull up a piece of string, use the short tool that was on the end of the piece of string, then take that short tool to get the long tool, and then take the long tool to get the food. And what Alice's experiment showed is that some of the birds were spontaneously able to solve that task. And that's really quite amazing because first it showed that the birds did understand that they needed the short stick to get the long stick, and then the long stick could be used to get the food. So they understand the causal processes. And the second amazing thing is the degree of inhibitory control they showed in doing that. Because when they initially get the short stick, the temptation would be, sticks get your food, there's some food. But instead of racing over to try and get the, the food out with a short tool, what they do instead is go and laboriously extract the long tool and then use the long tool to get the food. So it not only shows good causal understanding and ability to plan in a limited way, but also it shows quite good inhibitory control. So the delight, I think, really, about working with these crows is they are capable of making some causal inferences. They are capable of flexible problem solving. And that means that they're a joy and a, and a bit of a challenge to work with. So you've just seen some of the fascinating behaviors that birds are capable of. But they're not only able to manipulate objects in the environment, they're capable of manipulating each other. And I'd like to use an example, this humble species here, the chicken, to show you what I mean. Now chickens have very complex communication. When a male finds a piece of food in the presence of a female, he does this whole display for her because females actually prefer to mate with males that find more food. I'll give you an example. Listen and watch what he does, and watch her reaction off to the right-hand side of the screen. So there's the food, and sees staccato sounds. He picks up, drops the piece of food, but he doesn't eat it. He's waiting to give it to her. And watch her. Look how intently she is watching him. And she'll actually remember him, and in the future, she will prefer to mate with him. So it's very important in the chicken society to be the one that gives her food. And it would be quite easy if it was just the two of them, but it's not. In the chicken world, there's a whole group. There's dominant males, dominant females, and subordinates. When a dominant male 
finds a piece of food, he does that display that you just heard. And you see the hens come running. But the subordinate hen, she hangs back because there's aggression between the females because they want only access to that male. And look off to the right-hand side of the screen. You'll see that subordinate. He has no chance to get close to the females and no chance to get to the food. So what is he going to do? He's going to be sneaky. So if you see here, the male towards the tree trunk in the back, he's about to find a piece of food. And the alpha male's in the foreground with his two favorite hens. Watch what the subordinate does when he finds the piece of food. You see, he picks it up and drops it, but he doesn't make a sound. The female comes over, takes the piece of food, and she invites him to mate. And the subordinate has just successfully mated. He's passed on his genes to the next generation. So what is the alpha to do? The best thing he can do is try and reestablish his relationship with that female by doing a display called waltzing. Later on, he'll actually go and punish the subordinate. But it's not all about food, and it's not all about mating. There are other events in the environment that are equally important, like predators. And it's also important to know how to respond to the event. An aerial predator requires quite a different escape strategy than a terrestrial predator. And the birds are very good at communicating the type of predator that's there so that they let the females know how they should react. So this is an example of a male responding to a typical terrestrial predator. You hear that staccato sound? Those pulses, they're very easy to localize. And when the other group members hear it, they know exactly what to do. They look for a predator on the ground. And interestingly enough, if you ask a person to make a sound like a chicken, they'll make this sound. In the beginning, they see us as terrestrial predators, but eventually, they may see us as friends. And you'll be treated to some nice, quiet contact calls. But another kind of predator that's very important and actually more dangerous than the terrestrial predator is an aerial predator. So watch and listen to how different this male's response is. <coughs> so you hear that sound, it's very tonal. It's very hard for the predator to localize, but it's very easy for the group mates to hear and to know exactly what to do. They look up to the sky and or, or they run for cover. And watch again, notice what the male's body posture is. So if you watch, he crouches down, he rolls his eye up and looks to the sky with his left eye. And that's because chickens have a lateralized brain. And that means they can do two different things at the same time. With the left eye, they can watch for predators. And with the right eye, they can actually keep an eye out on their mates and their rivals. It's amazing what these birds' brains can do. And it's very different from the way that mammal brains are. But the capabilities are quite similar. So chickens have a wonderfully complex communication. They have very rich social lives, and they're very capable of doing sophisticated communication, capable of taking the perspective of another animal in ways that we never thought possible. In my work on Australian magpies, one of the foremost songbirds in Australia, I noticed that they had many uh, alarm calls. And we discovered that some of these alarm calls were in fact not just generalized signals, but they were the start of a lexicon. And uh, we call that a referential signal, meaning is a particular signal that is given at a particular time means only one thing. And every other member of the family or outside the family will understand that this means an eagle alarm call, for instance. And we decided uh, we are going to test this experimentally by recording their alarm calls first, a generic alarm call, for instance, and a mixed alarm call and one with an eagle alarm call. We put the sound source on the ground and eagles and eagle alarm calls usually generated viewing above because that's where the eagle would be circling. And we found that, in fact, magpies do respond to eagle alarm calls immediately and consistently by looking up.
In other words, we discovered referential signaling in magpies. Now, referential signaling in higher cognition have a very important place uh, in that uh, we think the beginning of lexicon also means that you have learned to communicate at a much higher and complex level. When the magpies viewed a source overhead, and remember the sound source was on the ground, they use their left eyes. So uh, that was the first exemplification of use of eyes and hemispheric specialisation in the wild. Now birds have lateralised brains, which means that they process information differently on the left and right sides. It's also known as hemispheric specialisation. And that used to be thought to be a function unique to humans. It was thought to be the kind of, give us our superiority in terms of language reflected in our right hand use. But now we know that a lot of vertebrates have lateralized brains, birds included. And we can show this very easily in birds simply by testing them by putting a patch over one eye or the other eye because information from one eye is processed mostly by the other side of the brain. So for example, if we put a patch over the bird's left eye and then give it a choice of grain and pebbles on the floor to peck at, the chick will peck at the grain and avoid pecking at the pebbles provided it's using its right eye. However, if you test it with the right eye covered, it will just peck at random. So this is a function of the right eye and the left hemisphere. There are other things that the chick does well. If it uses its left eye, you put a patch over the right eye. For one thing is it will attack and copulate. It also responds to predators. Detect a predator much more readily if it's approaching on its left side than on its right side. Now this seems to be a bit of a paradox because it should be a disadvantage to react only to predators or more strongly to predators on the left side and to prey on the right side. You'd miss a meal on the left side or you'd miss a predator on your right side. Well, what we tested was giving the bird two things to do at once. Pecking at grain, finding it and avoiding pecking at pebbles and at the same time presenting it with a model predator flying overhead, a model of a hawk flying overhead. And what the chick does, if it's lateralised, it can do both things together. It will learn to avoid pecking at the pebbles and it will look at the predator and decide it's not particularly interesting, it's, it's moving on, going away continues to peck on the floor. So it knows the predator's there, that it continues to learn to find the grain. A chick that's not lateralised for those two particular functions has real trouble when it's asked to do two things at once. It, first of all, might miss seeing the predator, but then when it does see the predator, it doesn't go back to finding or being able to peck at the grain and pebbles. And by the way, it's being tested in this task using both eyes. So it could do it fine as long as the predator's not there. But give it two things to do at once. And it not only can't do two things at once, but it gets more and more confused and thrown off track. So next day when you check whether they can remember the difference between grain and pebbles, the lateralised one can remember fine, but the non-lateralised one can't remember at all. So clearly having a lateralised brain gives the advantage of being able to do more than one thing at a time, which birds and of course other species too need to do all the time in the natural environment. But it doesn't explain why most individuals are lateralised in the same direction. Why do most birds use the left hemisphere for the same set of functions and vice versa for the right hemisphere.
why we don't know exactly how visual lateralization develops in most species, we do know that both genetic and environmental factors play a role in the development of this bias in birds. 99% of the embryos are positioned in the egg so that the right eye is close to the egg shell and the left eye is covered by the wing and the body. When the embryos are in, the, in this position, if the eggs are incubated in the dark, very few visual functions are lateralized. But if the eggs are incubated in light for two hours during the last three days before hatching, light penetrates the eggshell stimulating the right eye and the visual lateralization is stronger. Obviously, the development of this laterality of behaviors in birds must have evolved separately from mammals and it's certainly not a stepping stone on the path to human brain lateralization. Vertebrate species show strong lateralization that have evolved independently and different styles of brains have used different pathways within their nervous system to arrive at similar endpoints. The humble domestic chick, which is not traditionally considered a champion of mental life, is in fact an interesting model for investigating the animal mind. The chicks are precocial, which means that as soon as they hatch, they are quite mature and mobile. So in the lab, we can precisely control the chick's sensory and motor experience and observe how this affects their behavior. Also, Chicks show an amazing form of learning called filial imprinting. Very young chicks quickly learn to recognize an object if they are placed near to it for a while, and then they will try desperately to stay close to it. Obviously, this would normally be the mother hen, but in our experiment, we took advantage of the fact that imprinting can occur even with inanimate objects like simple colored cylinders. Here is a simple example. The chick is confined in a transparent pen and can see the imprinting object moving and disappearing behind one or other of two identical opaque screens. An opaque partition is placed in front of the transparent container. After a delay, during which the chick has to maintain in memory the position of the imprinting object, it is free to search. Chicks are very good at this task, even with delays as long as 60 seconds. Their performances are comparable to those of primates. We used a similar setup to see if chicks had an understanding of some basic properties such as size or shape and the way in which they could affect the visual occlusion of other objects. Some chicks were imprinted on a tall object and others on a wide one. And during tests, the chick was placed in a transparent holding box and was able to see the object moving along a straight midline towards the two identical screens. Their view was then obscured and the imprinting object was removed. The screens were replaced with two that were no longer identical. For example, the height or width was changed so that only one screen was large enough for the imprinting object to be hidden behind it. The partition was then removed and the chick was free to search for the object. Chicks typically choose to search only behind the screen that could hide the object. So we found that chicks have very sophisticated abilities concerning physical objects and the properties of occlusion. They seem to be born with a sort of um, intuitive physics. We use the same technique to explore chicks' abilities to perform simple addition and subtraction with small numbers. We knew from previous experiments that when chicks have been imprinted on artificial objects like these ones, they prefer to approach groups with more rather than fewer objects. Let's look at a simple example. 
Chicks are presented with an object which disappears behind a screen on the right and then with a series of objects that disappear behind a screen on the left. One object, two objects, three objects and four. We have had addition up to this point. Now we try some subtraction. One object is moved from the left to the right and then another one moves from the left to the right. So at this point, we would expect that Chick will choose the screen on the right side, and it does. But perhaps this was only because that was the last screen where it saw an object go. This can be easily checked for that. Come back to the addition. And this time, we'll only move one object from the left to the right. So the expectation would be that the chick would choose the screen on the left side. And this is exactly what chicks do. So this shows that chicks are able to carry out simple mental arithmetic, performing addition and subtraction with small numbers. Chicks also show good understanding of counting. For example, that number four comes after number three and before number five. Uh, for example, different group of chicks were trained to feed from, say, the third, the fourth, or the sixth container in a series of ten. And chicks were able to identify the correct container, whatever the length of the row. But were chicks using the number or simply the distance from the starting point to the correct food container? To check for this, the distance between the balls was changed. Now the second ball is where the fourth ball used to be, and the fourth is much farther away. So if the chick is using distance to solve the problem, it should choose the second and not the fourth container. However, results show that chicks choose the correct serial number, and not simply the distance. Chick's number cognition also illustrates nicely the lateralization of the brain Leslie Rogers described, namely that the left and the right side of the brain perform different functions exactly as in human beings. In one study, we trained chicks to feed only from the third out of seven food containers whose position in a circular arena was changed throughout the testing trials. The chicks learned the problem, but they consistently showed a strange stereotype behavior while counting. They always moved from left to right, even though the third ball was not close to that end of the line of balls. So we decided to investigate this curious phenomenon in a simple experiment. When the bird is placed in front of a line of 16 identical positions and food was only placed under the same position, say the fourth, chicks learn the task very easily. Then, at testing, when we rotate the line of balls, which position is the bird going to regard as correct? The fourth from the left or the fourth from the right? They choose systematically the fourth from the left. The existence of a mental line of number that extends from left to right is very well known in humans. However, this is usually explained as a result of writing and reading habits. And this is something that our chicks obviously cannot do. But it seems more likely that in the brains of these little chicks, like in human beings, visual attention is preferentially directed to the left because of the selective activation of the right hemisphere. So asymmetries of attention are not uniquely human characteristics that underlie an allegedly superior cognitive ability of human beings. Of all the birds, parrots are perhaps best known for their intelligence. Their resemblance to humans certainly enhances their reputation. They're capable of copying human speech, and like us, they have opposable thumbs which they can use to grasp objects. And when they do grasp and manipulate objects, they tend to do so with one hand over the other. And when presented with a novel problem, such as the string pull task you can see here, 
parrots show remarkable cognitive abilities. In many instances, individuals can solve the task on their first encounter, providing an example of insight. It seems that they have an understanding of the causal relationship between the food, the string and themselves, and the birds look at the problem and solve the task and find a solution without even interacting with it. Several themes emerge from this short film. Birds are evidently capable of some impressive cognitive feats, but it seems that their cognitive ability is linked to the structure of their brain. Really clever animals draw on the specialised processing that occurs in either hemisphere of their brain. Pandanus tool production, for example, is lateralised in crows. Chicks count from left to right, and strongly lateralised parrots excel in the string pull problem. So despite the divergent evolutionary pathways between humans and other animals, all of us share a bilateral brain structure, which seems to be the ticket to our cognitive success. suggest that they understand the causal relationship between the food, the string, and my head. <laughs> that was really close. <laughs> I didn't even drop that. Maybe Buzzy, or did you like it to say bye?